Good morning. Welcome to the closing session of the ARC Summit. I'm John Kerry, AARC State Auditor for Governor Mike DeWine of Ohio. In our opening session, we heard from Governor DeWine and ARC Federal Co-Chair Tim Thomas about leadership in response to COVID. In sessions two and three, we learned how those principles were put into uh, use through substance abuse training and infrastructure. As we hold our final session, we want to talk about the opportunities that are provided by attracting the socially distant tourists to the Appalachian region. There are exciting opportunities to learn, explore, and have fun throughout the 13 states that make up the region. Today, you will hear about a, how a few of our colleagues are making a difference in their states by attracting visitors to their areas. Tourism boosts the economy and is an important part of protecting the natural resources of the region, as well as preserving historical assets. It is also an important part of changing the image of Appalachia. In Ohio, we have used tourism as a way to boost the economy, as well as change negative stereotypes. It is important that we tell our story, and not let others define who we are as a region. It is a fine line to talk about why Appalachia is different and needs resources to compete, but also is a great place to live and to do business. I believe you will have fun today with Ohio Development Director Lydia Mahalik. Director Mahalik started us on this journey by moderating the first session. Governor DeWine and Director Mahalik have been a great supporter of the Governor's Office of Appalachia in general, but especially on the effort of expanding tourism efforts in Ohio. It's my pleasure to introduce Director Mahalik. Thank you very much, Director Carey, and uh, welcome. Uh, good morning and welcome, everyone, uh, to this fourth session of the 2020 Appalachian Regional Commission Summit. Our topic today is attracting the socially distant tourist. The way the session uh, is going to work uh, is we're going to hear from each of our panelists and then have a brief discussion. And then at the end of our discussion, we'll have time for questions from all of you. Uh, so please, as they pop up, uh, put your question down in the chat box and, and we'll do our best um, to, to get that answered. So go ahead and use the Zoom chat function and we'll, get our, we'll do our best to get to you uh, as, as many as we absolutely positively can. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives and changed the way businesses operate, especially our hospitality and tourism industry. And that's what we'll talk about here today, how the tourism industry is adapting and planning for the future. Before we get started, I wanted to provide a quick overview of some of the things that we've done here in Ohio. As he looked to reopen the state, Governor DeWine established an advisory group of travel and tourism business leaders to provide guidance, along with public health officials, on how to safely reopen tourism and hospitality businesses. Governor DeWine knew that what works on the manufacturing floor wouldn't necessarily work at a restaurant or retail shop or a state park, quite frankly. And because Tourism Ohio is part of development, I led this advisory group and we've worked dil diligently to help develop recommendations that have allowed our businesses to open safely and protect their employees and customers. We also launched a marketing campaign to encourage Ohioans to shop local, which included images of Ohioans wearing masks and practicing social distancing. With limited travel, we decided to remind people of the great restaurants and destinations in their backyards. Our Appalachian region has so much to offer, from state parks to historical sites, outdoor adventures to foodie trails. There's, not, there's, there's something that everyone uh, can do here uh, all across the region and across Ohio. And I believe we turned the challenge of the pandemic into an incredible opportunity. We're focused and engaged with our local businesses. We're building new partnerships to promote all that you can do here in the state of Ohio. And so our first speaker is Matt McLaren. He actually heads up Tourism Ohio and works with me here at Development to promote Ohio and Ohio's growing tourism industry. He is responsible for implementation of marketing, building industry partnerships, and increasing the visibility of the Ohio Find It Here brand. Prior to becoming the tourism director, Matt was senior vice president of the American Hotel Lodging Association. And prior to that, he served as president and CEO of the Ohio Hotel and Lodging Association. Matt? Kick us off. Thank you, Director Mahalik. It's certainly been a pleasure being the tourism director uh, while you've uh, been overseeing the Development Service Agency. We've certainly done a lot to promote the state and especially Appalachia. 
Uh, I actually grew up in Akron, Ohio, only a few counties away from Appalachia. And I remember my family going to uh, Atwood Lake in Tuscarawas County, uh, going to historic Roscoe Village in Coshocton. And then some of my favorite trips were in high school when uh, my dad and I would go down to uh, Eagle Sticks Golf Course in Zanesville, Ohio. And from those trips, along with recent trips, I've gotten to know Appalachia as more than a place of just beautiful scenery. Uh, I know it as a place with welcoming people, uh, incredible local food, and inspirational arts and culture. And in working with the governor's office of Appalachia, especially uh, Director Kerry, and also with Ohio's Appalachian Country, which is uh, a group of the visitors bureaus from Appalachian, Ohio, we've been able to show Appalachia as a place with welcoming people and inspirational places. From videos we've done like 48 hours in Appalachia that played on social to including places like Tom's Ice Cream Bowl in our uh, Ohio ice cream trail and then Casa Nueva, a uh, great restaurant in Athens, Ohio uh, in our road trips. Uh, we've been able to show that version of Appalachia. This year has been a little more difficult as the pandemic's brought on new challenges. Um, but by incorporating safety, and I'm going to show a video here in a moment, um, by incorporating safety into our advertising, we've still been able to show uh, a wonderful version of Appalachia that can be experienced during the pandemic. And if we can go ahead and play that video. Appalachian, Ohio. Wild tours and perfect pours open air and open water. Moments of awe and moments of awesome. Charming spaces and inspiring places. Find it here in Appalachian, Ohio. Happiness, joy, excitement, in Appalachian, Ohio, you can find it here. And if you can bring up my first slide. We think there's a lot of opportunity with Appalachia right now as the new consumer uh, and their wants fit a lot of what Ohio's Appalachian country has to offer. Uh, research from Longwoods International show that the new consumer is looking to drive to destinations. In Ohio and especially Appalachia have uh, historically been visited by those that are looking for drive to destinations. That new visitors more than ever looking for outdoor activities, the canoeing, the hiking, uh, the ways to be socially distant that Appalachia offers, and of course, safety. And through our marketing since May, we've been incorporating the social distancing, uh, the hand washing, the use of masks in the advertising itself. And the most recent Longwood study actually shows that consumers wanna see this. They wanna see how businesses in, have innovated and they wanna see those masks. In fact, 60% of respondents to that survey said they prefer a destination that requires masks. And with Appalachia being able to cater to the needs of the new uh, consumer, we see an opportunity to market it right now. We've been including Appalachia in much of our marketing campaign uh, throughout the summer, the spring and summer, and now going into the fall, Using that video that I just showed you, we're actually going to do a campaign that focuses specifically on Appalachia, hopefully extending the season. Uh, usually the travel season starts to wind down around Labor Day, especially for outdoor activities. But this year, with so many people working from home, so many students learning from home, we see an opportunity, especially as the weather stays nice and it's a beautiful sunny day here, that people will continue to travel. If we do the next slide, please. And this fall campaign plays off of a great article in Ohio Magazine that ran this summer, Five Ways to Explore Appalachia. It'll focus on the first and finest, right? Marietta, which was the first settlement in the Northwest Territory, a focus of a popular book, uh, The Pioneers, and also the host of today's virtual summit. It also includes Ohio's wine country, Ohio's Amish country, Hocking Hills, which are all a part of Appalachia in Ohio. And for those that want to learn in real life, the historic places across Appalachia, things like the John Rankin House, a famous abolitionist in Ripley, Ohio, and also Serpent Mound, an ancient mound shaped like a snake in Peebles, Ohio. We could go to the next slide. 
and all with images showing the safety, right? Showing that as travelers travel, they should make sure they wash their hands, stay socially distant and wear masks, things that are, you're able to do uh, within Appalachia, especially the, the amount of open space that it provides for that socially, that traveler that wants to be socially distant. And uh, you know, hence the name of today's session, attracting the socially distant traveler. Uh, and safety is really that key in, in our marketing as it becomes part of the brand and part of the reputation that will uh, keep people uh, coming to Appalachia and provide that opportunity for them to not only travel there this year, but for many years to come. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. You know, just as a quick follow up here, um, tell us what part uh, safety plays uh, in tourism now for Tourism Ohio. I mean, you, you talked about it a little bit briefly there, but in terms of the new safety procedures, uh, enforcement with customers, and of course, you know, marketing. For the, the travel businesses, their reputation is everything. And being able to uh, show this new safety standards that are in place and adhere to them is part of that reputation. And for businesses, uh, they want to be able to keep the consumer safe and employees safe. So incorporating those masks, the social distancing, and the hand washing uh, is in, in the other ways they've innovated to be able to um, be able to help the consumers who want safety is all a part of their brand. And with our marketing, it's actually become part of our brand. Showing the safety is now part of what Ohio Find It Here is all about because we want people to know whether they're traveling in the state or coming into this state through our marketing, the expectations that are here, that once they do travel, that they should be socially distancing, wearing a mask uh, and washing hands. And it helps setting that expectation through the marketing then helps the businesses and really through peer pressure, the locals uh, being able to enforce the, the new standards that are in place and help keep our friends our family and those employees safe. Very good, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Our next panelist uh, is Jeffrey Lusk. Jeffrey is the executive director of the Hatfield-McCoy Regional Recreation Authority, which is a multi-county economic development agency in charge of managing the over 700 mile Hatfield-McCoy recreational trail system in Southern West Virginia. Jeffrey currently serves as chairman of the West Virginia Tourism Commission and has worked as an economic development and business financing professional for over 25 years. It's so great to be with you today, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, Director Malik, and thank you to ARC for allowing me to present today and each of you for joining us this morning. As the director said, I'm Jeffrey Lusk, Executive Director of the Hatfield McCoy Regional Recreation Authority. My organization manages the nearly 800 mile Hatfield McCoy trail system in Southern West Virginia. We're a trail system designed for all-terrain vehicles, utility terrain vehicles, and, and off-road motorcycles. The Hatfield McCoy Trails is one of the fastest growing tourist attractions in West Virginia, and we were severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated shutdowns. I'd like to start this morning uh, with a short and brief newsreel that was done last month, 10 weeks after our reopening. But despite the uptick in COVID-19 numbers throughout the state, the ATV business is as busy as ever. Newswatch reporter Jake Karalexis went out to the Rock House Hatfield McCoy Trailhead for more details. ATV trails throughout the state were shut down on March 21st. Ahead of the most profitable time of the year, there was no telling what that would mean for the business going forward. It was devastating to us because, you know, we are a tourist attraction. Uh, the spring is a huge time for our ridership. We understand it was necessary that it was done, but, you know, it is devastating to our, to our lodging providers and to the trail system and to all the folks that depend on our visitors to come here. On May 8th, it was announced that trails would be allowed to reopen on May 21st. There was uncertainty if riders would come back. However, with attainable social distancing, Riders from all over were excited to get back on the trails. You can't get any more social distancing than this. You've got mountains between us. Uh, there are chances you won't see anyone for hours. Uh, you're outdoors. You're not touching anything. So not really worried about germs of any sort. Here that's open, it's free, it's uh, not many setbacks down here. The distancing afforded to ATV riders has resulted in a surge over the course of the summer. The Hatfield-McCoy Trail has almost recovered all of its losses from the two-month shutdown. 
we may actually have a slight increase this year as folks look towards the trails as an alternative to the beach vacation, as an alternative to that cruise vacation, someplace they can safely bring their families. So there's all the potential in the world, if we're, we're not shut down this fall, that we could actually see numbers that exceed our numbers last year because people are really looking at the trails as a vacation they can take that's a safe vacation for their family. In Logan County, Jake Carolexis, News Watch. So with that, uh, go on with, you know, how was the trail impacted by the pandemic this spring? Very simply, uh, we get over 85% of our riders, our non-West Virginia residents, folks that come here from other areas. With that, uh, we had folks coming from hot spots and it was just viewed that, well, this might be a way for having community spread in our local communities. So the trail system was subsequently ordered to shut down by the state in an attempt to contain the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The shutdown down was especially hard on us. When you look at the spring, we sell over 60% of our permits in the spring. The official shutdown date was Friday, March 20th. It was at the very beginning of our peak season. The trails were subsequently reauthorized to open May 21st, 62 days later, under our Governor Justice's West Virginia Strong Reopening Plan. In West Virginia, we did this sort of industry by industry. So our, our plan was each industry has its own set of rules. The plan outlined various staggered industry reopenings. It set out what each sector of business was rules to do. The Hatfield-McCoy trails, because of our size, we were treated as our own industry cluster. We had specific rules. The trails were given two weeks to implement all these rules. May the 8th, we, we got the notice to reopen May 21st. And in order to reopen, the trails had to adhere to three distinct set of rules. First being rules for our riders, the guests that were coming here. These, these 85% of the folks that are going to be riding our trails, these Rules came from PPE, face covering, self-screening, self-evaluations, temperature checks, seeking medical attention if symptoms arise, limiting the size of their groups, not sharing vehicles with individuals not in their party, not, not sharing safety equipment. So how did we connect to these to our riders? First, we placed it on our website. You know, second, we put it on the trail, doors of all of our trailheads. But third and most importantly, we have 112 vendors that participate with the Hatfield McCoy Trails. We put out the word to this 112 vendors by giving them a sheet that they could give each rider, a bright yellow sheet of paper that said, here's all the rules. Give this to the folks that show up to your business. Make sure they understand that it's a privilege that we got to reopen, that they need to be safe in our communities. They have indoor mask orders. They need to use hand sanitation. These rules helped and our vendors were the number one way to get it out. And we've, we've put out over 50,000 of those flyers since reopening. The second set of rules and requirements outlined how the trails could safely reopen. Our staff working on the trails outlined operational and procedures for employees. Uh, this was from self-screening, temperature checks, directing sick or symptomatic employees to stay home, training our employees on proper hand washing and sanitization, providing them with protective equipment, Riding with disinfectant wipes to wipe down their equipment and safety equipment. Social distancing, you know, our employees a lot of times would work in groups, but now our employees would have to work individually, you know, sanitizing work spaces and then putting out a lot of signage. The CDC signage and guidelines were very helpful. Uh, fourth uh, for us was, you know, how do we handle it with our vendors, you know, our lodging providers and our outfitters? You know, they all had their own unique rules. Uh, our lodging providers, you know, they were to communicate to their guests, provide their guests with PPE if they didn't have it. You know, our machine rental companies cleaning their equipment, you know, cleaning their helmets, PPE if their guest doesn't ha didn't have that, communicating with those riders. So with all these rules, uh, how did it go? Well, there's one word, uh, outstanding. Our reopening was absolutely outstanding. Our trail system in every month since our reopening, including the month of May, has exceeded that previous month for the previous year. So when we reopened, it was with great success. We could not believe the volume of ridership on the trails. Uh, we went from April of selling $521 worth of permits to in June selling almost half a million dollars in permits. We have nearly recovered all of our lost revenue with the reopening. And we think a big reason is people view the trail system as social distancing. They view it as a way to get out and do this activity, to do it outside, to be away from other folks, and to have a good family vacation. So, you know, we are really excited and happy we're open. We thank our partnerships at Tourism and the Governor's Office for letting us reopen, and so far it's been a huge success.
it's really exciting, Jeffrey. Uh, very cool to see uh, and hear all about uh, what's happening. Uh, tell me how you are balancing out promoting your area uh, and inviting travelers and visitors to vacation in your area without really upsetting or worrying uh, the local folks who may be against having people visit from other areas uh, with higher COVID numbers. You know, this was a uh, very challenging. We actually on social media <clears throat> had very poor feedback initially from our communities. There was a true concern from the local residents that these folks coming in from, from hot spots would be bringing the virus with them. And it was really through communications. And I can't thank our state director of tourism and our state tourism office and governor's office enough. You know, the governor got on and actually said, you know, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to safely do it. And our director of tourism, Chelsea Ruby, she worked closely with us to make sure that we had the proper information out on social media. We had the proper information to our community leaders. And it's been very well received. And, and we're happy to say with the contract tracing that's went on, we haven't had a single COVID case traced back to a trail rider. So that's really positive. But it was really communication and, and educating our local community that we're going to do everything we can to make sure when these folks come here to vacation, they vacation in a safe way and they follow all the rules. Now, that's great. Thanks, Jeffrey. Well, rounding out our panel uh, today is Katie Brown. Katie is the producing artistic director of Barter Theater which is one of the longest running professional theater companies in the nation. And she's actually worked at Barter for 22 years uh, as head of casting. She's been a choreographer, an educator, a designer, an actor, and a director of over 100 productions. It's great to have you with us, Katie. Thanks so much, Director Mahalik. So happy to be here. Like she said, my name is Katie Brown and I'm producing artistic director of Barter Theater, the State Theater of Virginia in Abingdon. Innovation during hard times is in barter theater's blood. We were founded during the Great Depression during, by hungry Broadway actors who hitchhiked down to Virginia from New York to set up a bartering theater, literally a trading theater with local farmers. A show costs 35 to 40 cents or the equivalent in produce. The first summer they made less than $5, but there was a collective weight gain of over 300 pounds among the actors and Barter's Ham for Hamlet model was off to a roaring start. We're one of the oldest professional theaters in the country and traditionally bring 145,000 people through a town of 8,000 every year. This March, we were days away from opening our spring shows. Our ticket sales and fundraising were set to hit or exceed our goals when we had to shut our doors for COVID like so many other people. With no way to safely bring audiences into the theater, we made the difficult decision to furlough 93 of our 104 employees. It became apparent very, very quickly that producing inside of our two historic theaters wasn't going to be a way forward for us in the immediate future. So I started driving around the area in search of an outdoor option amphitheaters, parking lots, fields, fairgrounds, and I kept coming back to the historic Moonlight Theater, a closed, extremely rundown drive-in on the outskirts of town. People have such great memories of watching movies under the stars there when it was still in business, and I thought it could be a key to our success if we tried to clean up the mess it was in, and that's exactly what we did. In partnership with area businesses, we were able to clear and refurbish the grounds and build a stage in front of the big screen. We worked with the medical advisory board to help us develop safety protocols for our staff, our volunteers, our patrons. Audience members drive in with their windows up for a touchless check-in, pull into their reserve spots, and they can watch the show from the safety of their vehicles. Sound comes through car stereos, and the quarantined actors perform on a stage that's also simulcast to the Moonlight's big screen. The Wizard of Oz was our first show at the Moonlight, and it opened on July 14th. During the four week run, over 6,000 audience members came, and our closing night, we had a bigger number of people that would have even fit into Barter's main stage. And most exciting for us, 46% of the people who came had never been to Barter Theater before, or at least not in recent years. Audiences love that they can come in their pajamas if they want, and that they get to experience the show accompanied by stars, fireflies, and on one night, an actual rainbow that arched over the stage and screen just before Dorothy sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow. One of the largest goals in producing at the Moonlight was to fulfill our responsibility of being one of the major economic drivers in our region. 
We wanted to make sure that we were helping area businesses that depend on us. Hotels and b and in our area have focused on safe practices for barter's out-of-state guests. And as you can see on the right side of the screen in the heat map, most of our Moonlight patrons are from closer driving distances, more likely to need food than lodging. So we partnered with the town of Abingdon and area restaurants on a play with your food initiative. Restaurants serve takeout theme to go with the shows that could be picked up and driven out to the Moonlight for private dinner theater and patrons' cars. 43% of barter patrons surveyed reported patronizing an Abingdon restaurant as a part of their visit to the Moonlight. Barter's continuing to produce drive-in style for the rest of the year. We ran Beauty and the Beast, and we have just opened Mary Poppins. We will run The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Dracula for the fall, and we're about to announce our Christmas season. Barter is proud to be walking in the footsteps of its founders who turned incredibly difficult circumstances into a time to serve the community with world-class theater in an innovative way. It's important now, just as it was then, to have a way to come together, to help each other, to hear stories together, and to make sure our communities are stronger than ever when this pandemic passes. Before we take a question, I'd like to share a video of the Moonlight in Action. So John, when you're ready. Wow, Katie, what a great story. I absolutely love it. And I really enjoyed uh, the way that with the enthusiasm uh, that you told it. Um, tell us what Barter's best practices are uh, for safety and then what impact uh, that has on bringing out of towners to your area in a safe way. Absolutely. And I won't go into all the all of the safety protocols, but if anybody's curious, feel free to reach out to me um, at Katie Brown at bartertheater.com. I'm happy to share any of the specifics that we do. But some of the, the high level things that have really helped us. One, having a medical advisory board. I recommend it to anybody. We have a, a group of, of doctors from all over the Eastern Seaboard, and they helped us develop all of our safety protocols and having those folks on speed dial. Every single day, we, we have a new situation that we've never thought of. How do we get the actor's haircut if they're in a quarantine bubble? And I have to call somebody and figure out how to do those things. So having those doctors has been invaluable. Um, also having a relationship with a testing facility. Uh, we've partnered with East Tennessee State University and we can send our people right away to get tested, get test results right back in terms of being able to get people into our quarantine bubble and back out or if we have a new hire, that kind of thing, just to make sure everybody's really safe. That has been huge. And then like Jeffrey was talking about, the clarity of messaging has been such a big deal. We want to make it easy for people to do the right thing. Um, so if we want people to be six feet apart, you know, yes, you're gonna mark that on the ground. We're also gonna show it on the screen at the big, at, um, at, on the big screen. We're also gonna mention it in the curtain speech. We're also gonna have signs and we're gonna have it on our website. How do you give it to all of those different people so that it's, it's very, very easy. Um, we also, you know, have every single parking spot lined out as a, as a double wide. So all we have to do is park in the middle of it, it makes it very, very easy for them to do um, what's gonna be the safest thing. 
Um, and it's meant that we haven't had to shut down completely like some other theaters that have had some outbreaks. It's also meant that we've been able to keep our community comfortable in a, in a similar way to what Jeffrey was talking about. We worried at the outset that people might be worried we were bringing people from out of state, but because we've been so public about our safety features and everybody who comes in to the field says, wow, you all have really, really done a lot of safety features. And it, it uh, has made people very comfortable and we haven't had any issues at all, um, thank goodness. So, um, so that, that's been great. But again, happy to share any of the specifics with anyone who might want them. Great, Katie, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure people will reach out to you uh, to learn more. You, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so lots of opportunity to learn best practices from all three of these panelists, quite frankly. And uh, again, we're happy uh, to have them with us today. So thank you very much. Uh, panelists. So before we get into uh, our first couple of discussion questions, I just want to remind everyone that we are taking questions uh, from uh, the audience, uh, from our viewers uh, this morning. So just go ahead and use that question and answer feature there down at the bottom uh, of your toolbar there in your Zoom program or your Zoom application, or I'm not all that technologically savvy. So just use the question and answer button. Uh, that would be really, really helpful because uh, we, we want to hear from you uh, as well. All right, Matt, uh, I'm going to open it up uh, with you. Uh, big picture here. Uh, wanting to know uh, from your perspective, really, what's been the biggest challenge uh, from COVID-19 and what type of innovation is really occurring uh, from your perspective in the state of Ohio to overcome it? Yeah, thank you, Director. Um, when you look at a tourism industry that so many businesses have created their model on really face-to-face -face interaction and hands-on type of experiences, and now you go into a pandemic and you have to figure out how you still create a great experience while being socially distanced or even catering to someone that doesn't want to leave their house or their car. And we actually still have a large number of people that, that feel that way. Um, businesses had to rethink their model. That was the biggest challenge, but the way they've innovated in so many, and, and we just saw it with Katie's success story there, uh, so many putting into place ways to do business and create an experience in a much safer way has uh, been a, a real bonus for their model that I think will serve them in years to come. And, and what I mean by that, if you look at places like restaurants, we had an ice cream place called Young's Jersey Dairy in Ohio, over 150 years in business. This year is the first time they added a drive through And I can see that drive through lasting far beyond the pandemic as they continue to do good business through it. Uh, places like Casa Nueva and uh, Athens, Ohio, that are now doing take and bake burritos, right? A traditional sit down restaurant. They found out a way to uh, cater those people that want carry out and more. I think those innovations that were put in place this year, but that can continue to serve in years to come is uh, one of the silver linings that we'll see. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so this next question is actually going to be, I I'd love to hear the perspective from both Jeffrey uh, and Katie. Um, you know, you guys have seen a tremendous amount of success. Uh, some innovation, obviously, that took place, uh, utilizing the opportunity to market an outdoor recreational activity um, that's safe. Um, tell me how we turn this trend of people seeking outdoor activities in Appalachia into repeat visits uh, in, in the years to come. Jeffrey, we'll start with you. Well, with us, you know, it was very surprising not only that we had our customers come back, but the number of new customers we receive. And lots of times those folks call our office first and, you know, introducing them to the Happy McCoy Trail System, introducing them that you can rent ATVs, you know, telling them about this is social distancing. It's, it's a great place to visit. And for us to get those folks to come back, I think now it's marketing into the future that to continue this same thing that recreation in, in, in Appalachia, in the outdoors. It's not only safe, but it's, it's a great way for you and your family to get away. And a lot of our communities don't have great connectivity. So if you want offline, it's a great way to get offline. But I think it's gonna be marketing into the future that you know it's not just something you come and do when there's a pandemic and you can't get on a plane or you can't get on a cruise ship. Coming to Appalachia should be something you can do all the time. And us being a driving distance, uh, safe driving distance, eight to 10 hours from, from a lot of major metropolitan areas, I think that we're going to see some benefits long-term for folks that have been introduced to us that are going to want to come back and do these Appalachian vacations again. Katie, would love to hear from you. Yes. 
Um, being theater artists, we think a lot in, in metaphor and the way we've been talking about this is about dating. You know, we feel like there's a lot of people, about half of the people that have come to the Moonlight are coming for the first time to barter and they've taken this first date with us. And so how do we say, we had a great time. Did you have a great time? We want you to come back and try us out again. So we've been inviting them back to the Moonlight in different ways. And then, you know, when we get back to the theater, we want them to understand, I think one of the things that's been so nice for people is how approachable it's been. You don't feel like you have to dress up. You can bring your dog, you know, whatever those things are. And we want people to know that theater is approachable all of the time. So we've been talking about, do we need to have a pajama night at the theater once we get back to it? You know, like how do we have ways to keep these people understanding that the great time that they had on our first date, they're going to keep having that great time with us as we build that relationship. So we've been in, in a deep conversation about how to keep these people in, in relation with us. That's great. I love that analogy, dating. Um, let's hope you can have lots, lots more dates moving forward, Katie. Very good. All right. Uh, so the last question uh, that I have prepared here uh, for you guys is going to be, um, you know, it's, it's two parts. And what I will say to everyone is keep those questions coming in uh, via the, the, the Q&A feature. Um, we're, we're running great on time and we're going to have an opportunity to get to quite a few of them. Uh, so stand by. I just want to have one more uh, question that, that I prepared here for you. Um, and, and, and it's two parts here. So do any of you uh, see a reduction uh, in carrying capacity or social distancing really as a permanent scenario uh, going forward? And if so, uh, is there anything that you'd recommend to those businesses that are most vulnerable uh, because of lower visitor or customer numbers? Katie, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, certainly we hope not in the long run. In the short run, I think we're all looking at how long is this going to go? And for theaters everywhere, when are we going to be able to gather people inside of our theaters, which is really the, the crux of our business? But I think for all of us, what's been so interesting and uh, invigorating about this, this time, the big, the big silver lining on the dark cloud, is how everybody's been innovating and, and changing. And I guess the advice that I would have for myself and for everyone is there were things that we thought were absolutely core to our businesses that we could not do without. And then when we were forced to do without them, um, all sorts of new things occurred to all of us. So I think what we're trying to do anyway is to take out things that we believed that we couldn't do without, obviously without sacrificing our core mission, but then to say, oh, well, what would this mean? Um, you know, a theater building and theater seats where everyone gets together, uh, I, I think it would have been easy to just throw up our hands and move on. But I, I think that knowing that we could do this um, and that, uh, restaurants can do some of the really amazing things that they've been doing. Any of these businesses that are changing, it lets us think a little bit bigger about the changes that are possible. So just leaving ourselves as open to that possibility and letting ourselves, our imaginations get as far down the road with those things as possible. That's certainly been a big help for us. No, that's great. So Matt, uh, tell me from an industry-wide perspective, um, your thoughts uh, on, on, the, on those two questions. Do you, do you see the reduction in carrying capacity or social distancing as a permanent scenario going forward? And if so, what are some recommendations that you would have to, to businesses that are most vulnerable? Yeah, uh, I see it for some business models working. And uh, what I mean by that, you heard both from Jeffrey and Katie about the number of new visits that they had this year, people that are experiencing their uh, attraction for the first time. I've heard that from several places within Appalachia. And many of those are um, travelers from city areas and such that uh, may be a little more affluent and willing to spend a little more money. So there's an opportunity for businesses out there. It's all about the experience. And that's one of the ways that you turn these uh, first time travelers into every year uh, visitors for your attraction for your area too. And being able to offer some higher end experiences and, and great experiences that may continue to be socially distant. I, I can see that in the future for several business models. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. All right, we're ready to start the Q&A uh, from our viewers. And Jeffrey, I'm going to start with you. This is a really good question. Um, it appears that clearly neighboring businesses are very critical 
um, to success with a lot of these innovations, especially with safety. Uh, so tell me, are there any partners or travelers uh, that you have encountered uh, that are expressing resistance uh, to, to the safety measures? And if so, tell us how you're dealing with that. So far from our businesses, it seems like our riders have been um, very, very compliant with the rules and we have not saw a lot of resistance uh, because West Virginia locked down so early and because there were other states that were already doing it. Most of the folks that are coming here already have to use face masks in their local areas. They already have to do the social distancing. So we have not met with any resistance at all from our riders. None of our lodging providers have called us and said, oh my gosh, you know, we had this group in and they were just horrible. Um, what we have saw is, is that our riders, you know, trying to find the place to eat. They're, they're getting takeout and things you would historically eat in. So there's these historic riders that are used to going into this restaurant and now they have to get that restaurant as takeout. So I, I think the resistance isn't as much resistance as a letdown to those historic things they've done or now they're having to do them much differently, much like Katie Innovated. Uh, our riders are having to, to get their lasagna to go, which is not what they used to do when they would come here. But we've had very good compliance uh, from our riders so far. Great. Um, so another question. Uh, and this will be uh, for our two attractions, uh, both Jeffrey uh, and Katie. Um, what are each of you doing to prepare your business uh, for the onset of cold weather uh, when outdoor activities may be less appealing uh, to those of us uh, who prefer warmer weather? <laughs> Katie, go ahead. Sure. We talked about this a good deal and we had hoped we might be able to be back inside in some way for the Christmas season. Christmas is a very, very big time for theaters nationwide, um, worldwide and in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, but just looking at the safety of that, we don't think that's the right way forward to make sure that everyone is as safe as possible. Um, so instead, we are going to keep ourselves out at the moonlight. So at so many of that, so many of those preparations have had to do with how do we turn it into a winter wonderland out there so it's fun. So we're looking at lights. We've got our um, our head of the box office is dressing is going to going to be Santa Claus. We've got a big tree going in. Um, we're going to do both things for younger younger audiences and older audiences as well and we're um, you know we're trying to partner with local um, with other local attractions that involve driving to see lights and that sort of thing um, so people can stay in their cars and stay warm and we've got to work on keeping our actors warm with on-stage heating and and all of those kinds of things so we think we can make it really really fun and attractive for people to be able to come out and and experience it in that way. Uh, we're also doing some things for Halloween, like double headers and socially distant digital costume uh, party, uh, costume contests and that kind of thing where we can flash your costume up on the screen and everybody can vote by honking their horns, you know. So there's some fun things that we can do to make it worth your while to come on out and stay in your car. Well, that's great. Jeffrey, would love your perspective. Time for trail riding uh, we're actually going to, to double down on marketing to our northeastern customers uh, we're going to look at them they already have the cold weather gear many of them are snowmobile enthusiasts we're going to ask them to come here and do trail riding in the winter when they might historically do snowmobile riding with our businesses we've been working with our businesses talking to them about hey if we still have to have outdoor dining you need to get heat lamps you need to find a way that you can stay open because if we're going to invite tourists here they're still going to want to eat and you're going to have to have accommodations outside and our businesses have been very receptive they're looking at this saying you know what we could put some heat lamps out there we could still have some outdoor dining uh, we do have this limited indoor seating capacity we can still do the to go so we're hoping that changing our marketing focus to a more northeastern clientele will, will cause those folks to come here because they're already used to, to recreating in the cold outdoors like snowmobiling and we're hoping that our businesses will adapt because we're probably still going to have the same limited indoor capacity. So we're going to have to try to keep that outdoor seating. And like Katie said, if it means heat lamps, we're just going to have a lot of heat lamps out there. So uh, we're still going to be outside and the snow is going to be falling on the plate, but you're going to be nice and warm while it happens. That's great, Jeffrey. Thank you. Uh, Matt, so we had a question earlier uh, about the survey. Uh, that you mentioned in your opening comments about tourism and innovation uh, for, for the safety of COVID. Um, is, is there a way that people can access uh, the results of that survey? How can people find it? Yeah, Longwoods International, it's actually an Ohio-based company, but they do work uh, for 
states and, and convention visitors bureaus all across the United States and really internationally. Uh, they've been doing a survey every two weeks. And if you go to Longwood's website, uh, they've been making it available to the tourism industry. So there should be an area on their site where you can go ahead and sign up for it. And for those in Ohio, um, you can always reach out to us. We're happy to share the survey as well. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, let's see, um, Katie, uh, what would, whoop, 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 it bounced around on me. Uh, so what would you tell a, a small business who doesn't have lots of resources uh, and obviously dealing with some tight budgets, um, how do they open differently? Of course, it, I think it probably depends a bit on the business, but I know, you know when we first started, um, we were down to 11 people on staff. We weren't sure when we would have money coming back in again because our entire business model is based on people coming inside. So um, we tried to think about the givens of what people could do right now, what would be safe to do right now, and what people were likely to do right now. And we used that to help guide us towards a new way of, a new way of working. So I would say the word we've been using a lot amongst ourselves is how do we stay scrappy? So if we think about, think about that, that scrappy mentality and also what, what do you think that your clientele wants and needs and how can you give it to them safely? And if you start there, it seems like it opens up the thinking a little bit more to give you some more options to use your limited resources on. We also, I think the other thing that I would recommend, there's no way that we would have been able to do this without the partnership of area businesses. And there were a lot of people who, you know, cared about people coming to town, especially if you are somebody who's going to be attracting people to town, being able to talk with other area businesses about how you can partner, how you can, um, and, and how you might be able to support each other that also opens up a, a world uh, a world of ideas and a world of help on both sides no that's great very very good advice I would say uh, particularly on the on the small business side you know uh, tourism Ohio really pivoted uh, early on as we discussed uh, with really pushing out and asking folks you know, since we can't really go, uh, you know, very far places and we all want to be safe because we want to slow the spread, um, you know, get out there and support your local businesses that quite frankly have been supporting you for decades. Uh, and so that seemed to be a message uh, that they were playing, that they loved, that they loved a lot. Uh, and it really drew folks in. And in that whole theme, I think, you know, every state's using this. I don't think it's necessarily specific to Ohio, but the whole in this together uh, theme, you know, really getting out there and supporting your local businesses. And I know uh, that our small businesses in Ohio really, really appreciated that kind of extra push uh, to, to get out and visit. Um, I've got another question, uh, and Jeffrey, I, I'd love to, to get your thoughts uh, on this one. Uh, and it's really about funding in relation to the changing tax base. Um, so this, this person is curious as to how smaller communities uh, are affording the extra cleaning and the safety uh, expenses when socially distanced travelers are choosing like the VRBO uh, or the Airbnb. Uh, and grocery purchases uh, versus maybe higher tax generating hotels uh, and restaurants. And if you have some thoughts you'd like to share with us on that. So, so it has been a huge challenge for our local communities, uh, specifically our convention and visitors bureaus who primarily exist from the hotel motel tax. So we went through a two month complete shutdown, almost no one in our hotels. Our communities get half of that money. So our cities, towns and counties also took it, took a huge hit. And, you know, the adjustments, uh, I really will commend the folks for adjusting. You know, our CVDs have, have cut back uh, in areas to, to save money. Our cities and towns have cut back. We are starting to see those folks come in again. But it is a real challenge for small communities. And, you know, many of our communities depend on that half bill McCoy trail rider to come downtown, spend their money so they get that B&O tax. They lost two months of that B&O tax. And, you know, I can't say enough about our state for, for stepping up and, and helping fill the gaps in these communities. And in West Virginia, our state's been very aggressive about trying to help our local city and county governments recover some of this lost revenue because it's just so challenging. And we're in a rural area and in rural areas, it's, it's much more difficult because there's, there's a much smaller tax base to draw from. So when you 
do shut down for two months, oftentimes it leads to layoffs and lack of services. But our communities have really adjusted. They've tightened their belts and our state uh, has really stepped up to help. Thank you for those insights. Um, so our next question, Matt, I'm going to throw to you. Uh, and I'm really, uh, this is a, it's a fun question for me. You know, we focus very heavily on workforce development uh, in our agency. And we know that workforce development is a, is a key driver in terms of conversations uh, all, all around Appalachia. Uh, and so uh, this actually came from a second year MBA student, Matt. And uh, they are curious to know where they could fit in into the industry and like what additional skill sets or talent or personnel uh, or, or otherwise uh, do you believe that could positively contribute uh, to, to, uh, to fill any gaps in this new movement uh, within uh, the tourism industry? That's a softball, Matt. You should enjoy yeah. that one. Yeah, I love it. And, and workforce development absolutely applies to the tourism industry too. Uh, there are lots of good jobs within the industry at the management level, at the uh, overseeing attractions, lodging, restaurants, retail, and more. And as we see more people come into Appalachia, that means more opportunity and the, the, the charming cities that we have uh, in Appalachia and the new attractions or the growing attractions that are there. Um, and new opportunities for either to move up quickly or, or to own small businesses. We've seen the number of cabin operators and owners continue to go up, especially around the Hocking Hills region and, and, and those sales. Uh, I've been doing very strong this year as well. Um, so you, you find your interest for the for those of you uh, that are that MBA or that student level. You, you find your interest, and in Ohio, um, there's so many opportunities. You can find it here, and either working in one of those businesses that already exist and moving up quickly as that business continues to grow, or uh, finding the way to to open your own business. And what's what I see is a, a tourism industry that'll continue to grow in Appalachia, Ohio. A great time to jump into the tourism industry. Lots of innovation and they need new thoughts and new ideas and new blood into it. And so um, I encourage that MBA student uh, to get out there and, and, uh, and, and make it yours. Uh, Katie, um, I know you mentioned a little bit about your visitors uh, that were traveling uh, where they could just uh, drive and they didn't have to have a hotel stay. Uh, but are you seeing an increase in visitors from within the state or the region? Um, that maybe those uh, in the past that that may that might have traveled farther away, and if they if that's the case, um, how are you going to keep those local visitors uh, post pandemic? Absolutely, we usually have people from all all over. In fact, all over the world at, at all of our um, at all of our shows at the theater, we always give a prize to the the first timer from the furthest distance, and we'll get people from all over the country and all over the world. And right now, you know, we are seeing a lot of license plates from lots of places. And you saw in my, in my um, presentation that we've had people from 26 different states. But yes, the bulk of the people have been from right here at home. And I think a lot of that, um, you know, uh, sometimes when you Google theater, a, a big question is, what do you wear and what do I do? And we're trying to let these people know that it's an, an approachable art form and this is going to be a good experience for them. So we've already offered special, special deals for people to come back, try us again. Um, we are doing special outreach to the people that have come for the very, very first time. Um, and, uh, and we plan to really double down on that. Um, at the point that we are able to go back into the theater because we think that that's the point when we could lose them because a lot of the people who have come to the moonlight are continuing to come over and over again to the shows and uh, we so we know that they like that there's also you know we've been asked a lot of times will we continue to do drive-in as well and so those are decisions that we'll have to look at as we see how long the pandemic's going to last and uh, and and how long this might be a good option for people but I think it's really, really important for us to keep in mind that these people have come out during this very special time and that we need to foster these relationships with them in a very intentional way. No, that's great, thank you. Well, guys, our time unfortunately is closing uh, to an end. And so I wanna wrap it up with one final question that I would love to get a perspective from each, each of you uh, from, and, and Jeffrey, we'll start with you. And the question is really, what's been the most effective marketing strategy for you uh, what what do you recommend to folks? TV ads, magazine ads, billboards, digital, social media? Would love to hear your thoughts. 
you know, as we've entered into this, what we found is social media has been absolutely our best outlet. Folks have so many questions about how can we come? What do we need to bring? Are the restaurants open? You know, what kind of safety equipment we have? Are you open? Are your trailheads open? And really social media is the great venue to get that out and say, answer questions, you know, answer these questions. And I can't say enough about our lodging providers and our facilities on their own sites, they get on and consistently answer these questions for our riders. So thousands and thousands of questions being answered by hundreds of vendors every day. It's almost like they have someone sitting at their computer ready to answer on a moment's notice. But there are so many questions for travelers right now. Social media is really the only way to communicate all of that to the traveler because the one question just leads to another. But I would definitely say social media. Great. Katie, your thoughts? We agree with that. In addition to digital, we've done pretty much all the things that you mentioned. You know, we've got our billboards, we've got all of these things, but really, like Jeffrey was saying, having that instantaneous uh, ability to let them know what's changing because things change so rapidly right now, being able to do that um, in a social in a social setting, and then specifically using video, we find that um, right now getting our getting our message across is much more effective in a video format because. Uh, people are so inundated with things to read right now, and uh, and that's been especially helpful on that front. Thanks, Katie and Matt. Certainly, I love the way that we've pivoted. We've we've used some different um, uh, forms of media and marketing and advertising. Uh, tell us from the state perspective uh, what your thoughts are here and close us out. Yeah, I'm aligned with our panelists. Uh, social continues to be the best for return on investment. Uh, we did a partnership with Ohio's Wine Country that helped us reach over 100,000 Instagram followers with Ohio Find It Here recently, uh, Ohio Wine Country being in Appalachia. Uh, but then also the digital side, as Katie mentioned, and with social and digital, you can update and be so responsive to a world that's been ever changing. And then I'll, I'll also add to that, whether it's in the video or, or any of your advertisements, how you portray yourself. And right now incorporating the marketing, showing what your business has done, has innovated to make things safer, and then showing what's expected by the consumer um, to be safe as well is a big part of that marketing. It creates your brand, it creates your reputation, and that's what's gonna make for a great experience and people coming back to Appalachia year over year. No, that's great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, guys, you've been phenomenal. Uh, thank you to Jeffrey and Katie and Matt. You've done a great job uh, today. I think it's been very informative. Uh, we appreciate all the questions uh, that we received uh, from our participants today. And uh, we're just grateful uh, that we have great folks uh, on the ground doing incredible things, particularly in the tourism industry in the Appalachian region. Uh, so with that, uh, Director Carey, I think I'm tossing it uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers and participants for making today's session uh, possible. It was really great. Thank you so much. As we conclude the ARC 2020 Virtual Summit, I want to take a moment to thank Governor Mike DeWine and Federal Co-Chair Tim Thomas for their leadership in holding the summit regarding economic innovation, ingenuity during COVID. I also want to thank our federal, state, and local partners for their support. We also heard from our private and nonprofit stakeholders who are key to fostering prosperity for the region. The Appalachian Regional Commission is founded on a state, local, and federal partnership. Much has been done and there are accomplishments to celebrate. Our challenge is to help the region recover from legacy economic issues to transform into a more vibrant economy that give communities the opportunity to keep and attract talented people. ARC is one of the instruments that can help address leadership, substance abuse, infrastructure, tourism, among other issues in an important way. As we finish today, let's commit to tell our story in our communities, including both the challenges and successes. Today's session and all the other sessions are on ARC.gov. Please complete the survey you'll receive in a few moments, and thank you again for joining us.